Magnetic Fields Part 1 for Special Higher Physics 1B. This video accompanies the lecture notes. Magnetic fields are regions of space where a moving charge will foil a force. The force felt by a moving charge in a magnetic field is given by F is equal to Q V cross B where V is the velocity of the charge and B is the magnetic field. So this is a cross product. It depends on the direction of the velocity and of the magnetic field. Magnetic fields, like electric fields, are represented by field lines. When we're drawing magnetic field lines, we draw them coming out of a north pole and into a south pole. So they look like this. You'll notice that around the Earth, magnetic field lines are drawn coming out of the South Pole and into the North Pole. And that's because the Earth effectively has a big bar magnet in it with a south magnetic pole at our north pole and a north magnetic pole at our south pole. And that's why if we have a compass needle on the earth, the north pole of the compass needle will point towards the north pole of the earth because there's a south pole of a magnet there and opposites attract. A major difference between magnetic fields and electric fields is that magnets can only be found as a dipole, that is a north and a south pole joined together. Nobody's ever found a magnetic monopole, whereas electric charges are often found as just a positive or just a negative. Okay, let's do a question. Imagine that you have a constant magnetic field. Here's our constant magnetic field going into the screen. You inject a charged particle into the space so that it initially travels in a direction perpendicular to the field. So it will inject a positive particle in here. What type of path does this particle follow? Well, when it's injected in, the force is equal to Q V cross B. And if we do the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field, we end up with a force going up the page. So it'll start moving like this. Once it's moving upwards, it will feel a force in that direction. So you actually get circular motion going around like this. So the answer to that, what type of path will it follow? It'll follow a circular path. What if the particle is initially traveling in the same direction as the field lines? So if initially the particle is going into the page as well, well in that case F is equal to zero. So it will keep going in a straight line. And then what happens if it's traveling somewhere between the two? So if it's going to the right and slightly into the screen. Well in that case, the component to the right will cause it to follow a circular path. The component into the screen will keep it going into the screen. So it's going to follow a corkscrew path into the screen. So if we were to look at it side on, it would look something like this. But that's going into the screen. Okay, more questions. This is example one. An electron in an old star television picture moves towards the front of the tube with a speed of 8.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second along the x-axis. Surrounding the neck of the tube are coils of wire that create a magnetic field of magnitude 0.025 teslas directed at an angle of 60 degrees to the x-axis and lying in the xy plane. So here's our particle travelling in the x-direction and let's draw on our magnetic field lines. They're making an angle of 60 degrees. 
with this x-axis. And part A says calculate the magnetic force on the electron. So we have F is equal to QV cross B. So we can substitute in, this is an electron, so its charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. The velocity is 8.0 times 10 to the 6. The magnetic field is 0 0.025. This is a cross product, so it will be times sine of the angle between them. When we solve that on the calculator, we get 2.77 times 10 to the minus 14 newtons. Now what we need to do is also work out the direction. So in this case, it's going into the screen. When using the right hand rule to calculate the direction, you need to remember that electrons are negative, and so it will have the opposite direction to a positive charge. Part B, describe the electric field you would need to apply to keep the electrons travelling with constant velocity. So we'll need to balance this magnetic force with an electric force. So we'll need QE is equal to QV cross B. And so we'll have the strength is equal to this magnetic force, 2.77 times 10 to the minus 14, over the charge on the electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. Solving that on your calculator, you end up with 1.73 times 10 to the 5 newtons per coulomb. And in this case, it needs to oppose this. So the electrons moving into the screen, so we have, need to have this electric field also going into the screen so that the positive charges are pulling it up out of the screen. Part C, what would happen to an electron with a different velocity that was placed in the fields in B? So if we were to place an electron with a smaller velocity in here, the magnetic force would be less but the electric force would remain the same. So in this case, it would move out of the screen slightly as the electric force is stronger, so it'll move in the direction the electric force is trying to make it move. What would be an application for this? You could use this as a velocity selector. If you only want charged particles with a specific velocity, if you balance your magnetic and electric fields for that velocity, then those are the only ones that will travel in a straight line. Example 2. A proton is moving in a circular orbit of radius 14 centimetres. So let's draw that. Now, since a proton's positive, it will go in this direction, in this magnetic field, anti-clockwise. And this has a radius of 14 centimetres. And we're told that the field strength is 0 0.35 teslas. And we're asked to find the speed of the proton. Well, the force acting on the proton is the magnetic force Q, V cross B. And the result of that force is that it travels in a circular path. So the resultant force is described by circular motion M V squared on R. So we can solve this to work out the velocity of the particle. We know that the velocity and the magnetic field are always at right angles, so we can effectively ignore this cross product here. So we've got QVB is equal to MV squared on R. These Vs cancel out, and we're trying to find V. So V is equal to QRB over M. Now, this is a proton, so we can substitute in all our values. The charge on the proton is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. The radius is 0 0.14. The magnetic field is 0 0.35. And the mass of a proton 
is given by 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So solving this on the calculator, you end up with 4.70 times 10 to the 6 meters per second as the speed of the proton. Example 3. In an experiment designed to measure the magnitude of a uniform magnetic field, electrons are accelerated from rest, so V0 is equal to 0, through a potential difference of 350 volts. And then enter a uniform magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity vector of the electrons. So here's our uniform magnetic field. Here's our electron about to enter the magnetic field and then when it does it will follow a curved path like this and we're told that the radius of this path is equal to 7.5 centimeters. Now part A of the question says what is the magnitude of the magnetic field? So we know that the F is equal to QV cross B is the force acting on the electron which is causing it to undergo circular motion. And so to find B, we'll have B is equal to MV over QR. So what we, we know the radius, we know the charge, we know the mass of an electron. So what we need to do is work out the velocity. So to work out the velocity, we'll need to use this information here. We know that potential energy... is converted into kinetic energy. So its change in potential energy is equal to the charge times the potential that it moves through. So this is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 times 350 volts. So this gives us 5.607 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. This is how much it loses in potential energy. When it loses that as potential, it gains it as kinetic energy. And as it starts from rest, it has no initial kinetic energy. So we've got a half mv squared is equal to 5.607 times 10 to the minus 17. And this is an electron. So the mass is given by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So solving this, we end up with V squared is equal to 1.23 times 10 to the 14. And so V is equal to 11.09 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So now what we can do is substitute everything into here to end up with our magnetic field strength. So we have V is equal to 11.09 times 10 to the 6 times 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 over 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 times the radius. Solving that, we end up with 8.41 times 10 to the minus 4 Teslas. Now part B says, what is the angular speed of the electron? Well, we can use the equation omega is equal to V on R, and all we need to do is substitute in 11.09 times 10 to the 6 over 0.075, and this gives us 1.48 times 10 to the 8 radians per second. Part C, what would happen if you repeated the same experiment with helium nuclei? Okay, let's use a different colour. Well, the difference between helium and electrons is that the Q for helium is twice the Q for electrons electron and the mass of a helium is much greater than the mass of the electron. So let's have a look at how that's going to affect the radius. So the radius will be given by mv over b cube. Now the problem is that our velocity is also going to be affected by changing the particle because this velocity was gotten through the energy considerations and if 
the particles heavier, we need to put in more energy to get it to the same velocity. So let's get an expression for the velocity of the particle. So we've got that a half mv squared is equal to q delta v, which tells us that the velocity will be equal to q delta v times 2 over m, and then we need to take the square root of that. So now what we can do is substitute this into this expression here. So our radius is equal to m over b q times root 2 delta v times root q over root m. And we'll get a bit of cancellation here. So it'll be root 2 delta v on b times root m on root q. Now the mass is increasing much faster than the charge. So you can see that this radius is going to be bigger. And then part D, what is an industrial application for this? Mass spectrometers use this industrially to distinguish between different isotopes of the same element. In that case, they all have the same charge, but they have a different mass. And as the mass is changing, the radius is going to change. So if you only want one isotope, this is a way to separate them. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is charge density. Charge density is given the symbol J, and you might recognize it from Maxwell's third equation, C squared, del the curl of B, is equal to DE dt plus the current density over epsilon naught. So we won't be proving this one of Maxwell's equations, but it's probably useful for you to know what J is. So J is the current density, and it's the amount of charge passing through a surface in a unit time. So in terms of things that you already know about, we can write that J is equal to the current over the cross-sectional area through which it's passing. This is a vector, so this is in the direction that the current is flowing. And you know that current is equal to the charge over the time passing through something. So the current density we can also write as the total charge over through a given cross-sectional area in a time t. Now we can work out how much charge is flowing through a surface. Let's just forget about charge for a minute and just because it's a bit easier to visualize, imagine water flowing through a pipe here with speed V and we're going to collect it in a bucket down here and we want to know well what mass of water do we collect in a given time T. Well you can probably see that the mass is going to be equal to the cross-sectional area of the pipe times V. That will give you the volume that is flowing out. So then to get the total mass in our bucket, we'd need to times it by the density of the water. So if it was water, that would be one kilogram per liter. And then we'd need to times that by the time. And this would give us the total mass of water in the bucket. So that's pretty easy to visualize. Exactly the same thing happens with charge. So the total charge that we get flowing through a certain cross-sectional area of pipe is going to be equal to the cross-section of the pipe times the velocity of the charge carriers times the density of the charge carriers times the time t. So this is the amount of charge so we can put this in up here. So we've got 
A V rho T over A T. And the direction in this case was the direction of the current, which is the direction that the charge carriers are moving. So that V is actually a vector. So you can see the A's and the T's cancel out. And so the current density is just equal to the velocity of the charge carriers times the density of the charge carriers. Now, often it's helpful to write this as the number of charge carriers per unit volume times the charge on each of those charge carriers. So this is the equivalent to the density times the velocity. And that's a V, sorry, it's a bit extra curl there. Let's get rid of the extra curl. Okay, so this is equal to the current density. Generally, the charge carriers for a wire are going to be electrons. So generally, this Q is going to be equal to E. So this is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. And this is the charge on each carrier. Can be E, but doesn't have to be. Okay, so what we can do now is using this current density, we can actually prove, we can show that div of J is equal to minus D rho dt. So this part isn't examinable because it's going into vector calculus, but we can show it now. So let's let's show it now. And this actually comes about because of the law of conservation of charge. So charge is always conserved. It cannot be created or destroyed. Okay, so one way we can think about this is consider a closed surface. Now, that's a three-dimensional closed surface. The only way that we can change the amount of charge inside this surface, let's call that Q inside, is if we have charge flowing into the surface. So the only way to change the charge inside the surface is to have a flux of charge entering the surface. So mathematically, we can write, we need a current density into the surface if we want to change the amount of charge inside the surface. So the amount of charge inside a surface is just going to be equal to the volume integral, so the volume inside, this is a three-dimensional integral, um, the charge density times the volume. That's going to give us the total charge inside. And if we want to change this number, then we need to have some charge density flowing in to that surface. So now in order to get this result here, we're going to need to make use of Gauss's theorem, which bit beyond this course but we have mentioned it briefly before. It tells us that if we have a field and we differentiate it this way then that is equal to the same field. In this case we've got a surface integral, this is a volume integral dot n ds and remember n ds is what we've been calling dA in other parts of this course. So in this case, the field that we're going to be considering is J, the current density. So we can write here, we've got, this is this thing, this thing, we've got J dA, and we've said that that's equal to dQ inside dt, but Q inside is this. So this is equal to minus D dt of the volume integral of um, rho dv. And so now what we can do is we can move this inside. So this is equal to the volume integral of minus d dt rho dv. And then looking at Gauss's theorem here, we can see that this thing is equal to this thing. So what we end up with is minus d rho 
dt is equal to del of j. And so we've proved this one here using Gauss's theorem. So an interesting result, but not examinable in this course. Now we're going to consider what happens when we put a current carrying wire into a magnetic field. So here we have a constant magnetic field. And here we have a wire. with electrons flowing through it with a speed VD, the drift velocity. Now we know that the force on each of those electrons is given by QV cross B. And what we need to do now is work out what's the total force on the wire. So if we want to work out the force on a segment of wire here, we need to work out how many charge carriers are in this section of wire and each of those charge carriers is going to feel a force given by this expression here. So the number of charge carriers is equal to the number of charge carriers per unit volume times the volume. And so if we times this by QV cross B, we've now got our total force on this part of the wire. Now we've just derived the relationship that J, the current density, is equal to NQV. So we can replace this NQV with J. So we've got delta F, the force on this section of wire, is equal to the volume of the wire times J cross B. And now let's consider that our wire has cross-sectional area A. So the current density is related to the current through the current density is equal to I over the area times the normal direction because it's got a direction which is the direction of this velocity. And so we've got that our force is equal to delta V where this is the volume I over A N cross B. And now the volume over the surface area that's just equal to the length of this section of wire. So we have got the length I N cross B. Now what we can do is we can make this length into a vector so that it's got a direction. So this normal direction is the same direction as the length of wire. So we can write this as I L cross B. And that tells us the size of the force on a section of wire in the magnetic field. Okay, now we're going to do a problem. We've got a constant magnetic field with field strength B and we've got a loop of current going like this. This is the X direction, this is the Y direction and the current is flowing this way. This wire has been bent to form a semicircle with radius r. Now, part A of the question asks us find the force acting on the straight section of wire. So this is this section along here. So A. We know that the force is equal to I L cross B. So along here, we've got that our length and our magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So I is given by I, the length is given by 2R, the magnetic field strength is B, and sine theta is going to be 1. So this is equal to 2IRB, and now it's a vector, so we need to work out the direction. So the direction is out of the screen. You just do that with the right hand rule. Now part B says find the force acting on the curved section of the wire. So to do that, let's break the wire up into little sections with d theta as the angle in here, and this is angle theta. 
Now we know for arc length that S, if this is length, we'll call it DS, DS is equal to R D theta. And so DF, the force on this section of wire is going to be equal to I, R D theta, B, and then we have to do the sine of the angle between them to account for this cross product, so that will be sine theta. So to get the total force, we'll need to add up, going from theta is equal to zero here, to theta is equal to pi, all the contributions. So we've got F is equal to the integral from zero to pi of I R B sine theta d theta. So this is equal to I R B. When we integrate sine theta, we get minus cos theta and we're going from pi to zero. And so this is equal to I R B. Cos of pi is minus one. So this is one plus cos of zero is one. So this is one plus one. So this is equal to two I R B. So it's got the same magnitude. Let's now just consider the direction the direction in this case is going into the screen. That's just using the right hand rule again. Now you notice that if we add this one to this one, the total force is zero. And this is actually true for any current loop in a constant magnetic field. Now we've just shown that there's a force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. Now current carrying wire will actually also produce a force on a magnet. So this was discovered by Ersted. He found that if he moved a magnet near a current carrying wire then the magnet was deflected. So this raised the question if we have a current carrying wire how much force will it produce on the magnet? So what's the strength of the magnetic field produced by a current carrying wire? This was initially done experimentally rather than theoretically. It's possible to do it theoretically with Maxwell's equations, but now we're going to start with how they came up with an equation experimentally. So imagine that we have a piece of wire like this. Let's consider a little part of the wire with length ds and what we want to know is here's point P what magnetic field does ds produce at P. So let's let ds be a distance r from P this is the direction of R. This is the direction of the current I. We'll give ds the direction rather than the current, but the current is flowing in that direction. So what we want to know is what's the magnetic field at P produced by this section? So what we'd expect is we'd expect it to obey some inverse square law. So it should be proportional to 1 on R squared. We'd also expect it to be proportional to the current and to the length of this section, ds. So they shouldn't, this isn't a unit vector, we shouldn't really have the hat on it there. So we'd expect it to be something like this. Experimentally, Bio and Savar showed that db is equal to mu naught over 4 pi i ds cross r. Now this is a unit vector r, so this has a direction, but the magnitude's 1 over r squared. So that's our inverse relationship. We've got the i, and it's proportional to the ds. So this is called the bio savart law. And if we add up all the contributions from the different sections along this wire, we can get the total magnetic field at p. In this case, mu naught is equal to the permeability of free space.
and it has a value of 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meters per amp. Now the permeability of free space is actually related to the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught, through C, the speed of light is equal to 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. So you'll be measuring mu naught, the permeability of free space, in the slinky coil, magnetic fields in the slinky coil laboratory exercise. The bias of our law is quite tedious to use, but it will give you the magnetic field for any situation. We're going to consider example 5 from the lecture notes now. In this example, we have a long, thin, straight wire carrying a constant current I. So here's our piece of wire. It's placed along the x-axis and it's carrying a current I. We consider a point P, which is a distance A above the wire. And we'll call this theta 1 and this theta 2. These are not necessarily equal. P is not necessarily above the midpoint of the wire. And we're asked to determine the magnitude of the magnetic field at P due to the current. So to answer this question, what we'll do is we'll consider a little increment here with length dx and we'll work out what magnetic field does dx generate at P and then what we'll need to do is sum up all the little increments dx along this bar. So we can write dB is equal to mu naught over 4 pi I ds, which in our case will be dx, so let's write that as dx, cross the direction of r over r squared. So r is the distance of dx from p. So that's this distance in here. Let's let this distance here be measured as x. So we have that r is equal to the square root of a squared plus x squared. So this will be substituted in for here. Let's have a little look at the dx cross r. This is a cross product. So dx has magnitude dx. r has magnitude 1 because it's a unit vector in the direction r. And then what we'll have is we'll have the sine of the angle between these two. So if this angle up here is r theta, the sine of the angle between x and r will be cos theta, because it will be sine 90 minus theta. And this is directed up out of the screen. So that tells us that dB is equal to mu naught over 4 pi i times dx cos theta over a squared plus x squared. Now our problem is that we have two variables here, x and theta. What we need to do is put them all in terms of the same variable. We have two options. We can either substitute in for the cos theta with something in terms of x, which would be cos theta is equal to a over the square root of a squared plus x squared, and solve the integral that way. Or we can replace this x with its expression in terms of theta. So we can write tan theta. So tan theta is equal to the opposite, which is x over the adjacent a. And this is negative, as x is going in the negative direction. So you can see from this that x will be equal to minus a tan theta. And so dx d theta is equal to minus a sec squared theta, which is equal to minus a over cos squared theta. So let's place all these into this derivative here. So we've got mu naught over 4 pi i. Now dx is equal to a over cos squared theta with a negative sign d theta. And then we have to times it by cos theta. And then we've got a squared plus x squared. So a squared plus x squared is equal to a squared outside of 1 plus tan squared theta 
And since you know sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1, if we divide everything by cos squared theta, we end up with tan squared theta plus 1 is equal to 1 over cos squared theta. So we can put a squared plus x squared, 1 on a squared plus x squared is equal to cos squared theta. Okay, so this cancels with this, and we end up with a squared plus x squared is a squared on cos squared theta. So this should be cos squared theta over a squared. And so we've got mu naught over 4 pi, i over a, we've got a negative sign, and then we're left with cos theta, d theta. Okay, now to get the total magnetic field at p, so b at p, we need to sum up from theta 1 all the way to theta 2. So we've got minus mu naught over 4 pi i a times the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of cos theta d theta. When we integrate cos theta, we end up with sine theta. So this is sine theta 2 minus sine theta 1. So we could write this if we wanted as mu over not over 4 pi, i over a sine theta 1 minus sine theta 2. Now, an interesting case is to, to consider is what happens if this line becomes infinite. As this line becomes infinite, theta 1 goes to pi on 2. And the way we've defined it here, theta 2 goes to minus pi on 2. And so we've got that the magnetic field at P is equal to mu naught over 4 pi I over A sine pi on 2 minus sine of minus pi on 2. And this is 1, this is minus 1. So we end up with mu naught over 2 pi I A. So this is the magnetic field that an infinitely long wire makes. And a, little a here, is the distance of the point from that wire. Now we're going to look at example 6. In the lecture notes, in this problem we have a loop of wire in the yz plane. So here's our loop of wire. It's got a current flowing around it like this. The radius, this is, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis. The radius of this loop is given by A. And what we want to do is find the magnetic field at a point P, which is a distance x along the x-axis. And to do that, we need to use the bias of art law. So dB is equal to mu naught over 4 pi i ds cross r over r squared, where this is the unit vector r. Now to answer this question, we're going to do it in the standard way. Let's start with a little increment up here. Let's call it dr because it, it's a radial part and we'll consider what magnetic field does dr create at our point p here. In this case, this is our r vector. So to picture it, let's just draw it in the y x plane. So here's y, here's x. Our point is a distance a up the y axis. Here's our point P, which is a distance x along the x-axis. And this is our R, which has got the magnitude, the square root of A squared plus x squared. And what we have to do is consider in which direction is dB, due to this little increment here, going to be. So in this case, dS is flowing in the z direction, because that's the direction the current's flowing. And so when you do that crossed with R, the direction dB is going to be at right angles to R and still in the XY plane. So that's 90 degrees. This is dB. 
and we'll split this up into a dBx and well this will be dBy and you can see if we consider the point on the circle opposite this point then the dBx will have an opposite y component but the same x component so it's just the x components that we're going to have to add together so let's call this angle here theta then this is 90 minus theta and this angle here is theta and what we're going to need to do is add up all the contributions to dbx around the loop so we will have db x is equal to mu naught over 4 pi i dr and this has got magnitude 1 and the angle between these two is 90 degrees and this is over r squared which is a squared plus x squared and then to get the x component we times it by cos theta and now what we can do is we can write cos theta is equal to adjacent which is a over the hypotenuse so that's over a squared plus x squared so dbx mu naught over 4 pi i dr over a squared plus x squared to the 3 on 2 times a so that's replacing the cos theta with a over the square root of a squared plus x squared now what we need to do is we need to add up all those dbx components around this loop so we've got b in the x direction is equal to the integral of dbx around the loop and so that's equal to mu naught over 4 pi i over a squared plus x squared to the 3 on 2 a times the integral of dr around the loop and this just means what distance do we travel going around the loop and so this thing is equal to 2 pi a the circumference of that circle so we've got mu naught i a times 2 pi a over 4 pi a squared plus x squared to the 3 on 2 and so 2 pi and 4 pi will cancel out and we'll end up with mu naught i a squared over 2 a squared plus x squared to the 3 over 2 as you can see that's quite a long and tedious way to do the problem but it will give us our answer and that is in the positive x direction and that's the end of this video